Good morning, everyone. I think we are now live. Uh, welcome to our first Green Deal Hour, um, organized by the European Committee of the Regions. For those who are not familiar with this EU body, we are the EU Assembly of Cities and Regions. And it's a delight, an honor, and a pleasure to have for this first session, Rafael Sashkovsky, Mayor of Warsaw. Good morning, Mayor. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'm going to start very straightforward. The pandemic COVID-19 um, does has not erased the fact that we do live in a climate emergency. Is the pandemic pushing the climate agenda forward or backwards? Dzień dobry wszystkim. Good morning. Good afternoon. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Uh, it is an honor to to uh, to be with you and to have this opportunity to exchange views on on uh, our utmost priority. Because uh, if we do not treat the Green Deal seriously, if we do not uh, treat the climate emergency as the top priority, um, you know, we are going to waste the greatest opportunity to actually tackle one of the biggest problems that is ahead of us. And I think that if uh, uh, if a politician, if someone involved in social life uh, deems himself or herself to be progressive, to respond uh, to the citizens' needs and to really uh, tackle head on the biggest uh, the biggest challenges that are before us, that is our topmost priority. Now, uh, it is a very good question because uh, whether uh, the pandemic and uh, and our fight against climate change are going to 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 reinforce one another in a sense that the pandemic will allow us to change our thinking about the future and will allow us to actually revolutionize the way in which we do business or whether politicians will just focus on uh, the pandemic and forget about all the priorities this is one of the most topical questions that are before us now i'm absolutely convinced that there is no other way but to actually do two things at the same time deal with the pandemic and bring recovery back to europe and at the same time use this crisis as an opportunity to change our way of thinking and change our way of doing business and uh, with the money that is on the table that is supposed to actually rejuvenate the economy and recover uh, help us recover from the crisis to use it wisely so that uh, we invest it in ways that are going to be friendly for the environment that are going to help us tackle climate change uh, that are going to actually put an end to the fossil fuel economy in the in the in the future in the foreseeable future so that we can emerge strong innovative so that we can emerge uh, revolutionized um, so we can think out of the box and most importantly save the climate good in the and that's that's kind of the objective of the european green deal we are going to talk today about uh the green deal what is it exactly uh it's the european just to uh, be for our audience which are maybe not familiar with the green deal it's the european union new strategy to reach climate neutrality for 2050. um that's going to be a main topic of today uh with uh you uh rafael mayor of warsaw we are going to talk about the climate pact as well um, I'm here kind of summarizing all our, our five uh, key topics today and then we will go through very concrete examples uh, what Warsaw is actually uh, doing to move uh, sustainability forward in three areas uh, energy efficiency in buildings the transport and making our cities more green mm, uh, the team here is uh, telling me that uh, we might have a technical problem but um, um, I would like to ask you, meanwhile, uh, Rafael, uh, about the Green Deal, our first uh, topic. Uh, uh, are we, do you think it is feasible to reach climate neutrality, that the European Union has the sufficient means uh, to reach climate neutrality by 2050 uh, right now with, uh, as you said, with the money that's in the table to push for the recovery? Um, will these uh, means be sufficient? Well, first of all, uh, we need the commitment, a real commitment of the of the national governments. We, re, we need the commitments of the local and regional authorities, and we need the commitment of the people on the ground. Uh, and if we have that commitment, if we raise awareness, and that's what uh, Green uh, Pact is all about among our citizens, this is our topmost priority, 
then I think that the money which is on the table should be sufficient for us to be ambitious. Now, of course, the money is not enough. It has to be uh, wisely spent. And unfortunately, some of the governments, uh, the conservative government in Poland is, uh, is, is a good case in point, uh, might not be able to actually spend the money in the most effective way because, you know, these guys are politicizing everything and they want to uh, share the money uh, according to political criteria. So even if the money is on the table, the Commission, the European Parliament, and of course the Committee of the Regions uh, needs to make sure that the money is wisely spent and effectively spent so that we uh, really attack the priorities, we attack the main sources of global warming so that we can be, uh, so that we can be as effective as possible. I think that the tools mm -hmm. are on the table when it comes to legislative means, when it comes to the money and so on. I think that the European Union showed uh, an incredible commitment. When we push the laggards and when we include the regional and local authorities, and that's the job of the Committee of the Regions as well, then we can we can be successful. So there, there, uh, you know, the the Committee of the Regions has one claim that uh, cities and regions should be uh, directly involved in the design of the economic recovery plans that have to take us out of this economic and social crisis. Now, we uh, succeeded in, uh, in, uh, in making the European Commission uh, do a recommendation to member states to actually involve cities and regions in the design of recovery plans. We are concerned about a certain over-centralization. How was this process in Poland? Like, have you been contacted by the central government on what priorities Warsaw would like to invest? Well, yes, I mean, we want the local and regional authorities to be involved and not because we think we are the wisest, but simply because we think we are closest to the people. And if you really want to attack the sources of emissions, then you need to uh, do all the work on the ground. And of course, you know, the cities are responsible for producing 70% of the emissions, so we know best how to tackle the problem. And on top of that, we are pressurized, we're pushed by the people uh, every day of our life when we walk the streets of our cities. You know, people ask us questions about how are we going to tackle the most important problem that, that is ahead of us. Uh, because it's, of course, saving the planet, but it's also fighting for cleaner air, uh, which, which is more palpable and which people understand better. Now, unfortunately, uh, quite a lot of governments are, want to centralize the, 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 the system uh, and wants to take all the shots and all the decisions on how the money should be spent. This is not a good idea. I mean, we could, we should include as many actors, as many stakeholders as possible, regional and local authorities, but also non-governmental organizations, also the citizens. And that's what we are doing uh, with the European Commission through, uh, through the Green Pact. The Polish government decided, you know, just to fake some, uh, some consultations. Uh, they are uh, taking decisions which are grounded in politics. They are uh, unfortunately now adopting criteria which are going to be influenced by, 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 uh, by politics, not by effectiveness. And that's why we, uh, we are, are in constant contact with the, the European Commission so that the, that the uh, scru scrutiny of the whole process is as strong as possible because we need to spend the money wisely we need to adopt transparent and non-political criteria and that's what we're going to push for and it's not only the case of poland hungary i've talked to my colleagues in spain they are also complaining that the government is centralizing the process my italian colleagues are not so happy so i think that we are all uh, having a good arguments to make that we should be all included because then we will make sure that the money is spent in a way which is mo most effective Absolutely, and and next next weeks and next months will be crucial for that because um, one thing is to involve cities and regions in the design, and that is obviously somehow disappointing across member states. Um, but well, now we come to the implementation. So uh, here, do we have another chance uh, to to work uh, for the EU to work directly with cities and regions? I mean, how are we going to tackle the uh, that issue uh, of over centralization when it comes to the implementation of all the the, the investments um, to keep to put the EU economy back on track? Yes, of course. I mean, implementation should be uh, should be overseen should be overseen by local and uh, uh, and regional authorities. We should have part in overseeing the whole process because we are the experts. 
And of course, the European institutions should also oversee the process so that it's as transparent as possible and as as uh, as non-partisan, as non-political as possible. I mean, for example, the uh, the conservative government in Poland, the peace government, took a decision to actually make it difficult for the cities to apply for help. They decided to uh, make it difficult for cities to actually invest in public transportation. They're doing it on purpose because they know that people in cities are generally more liberal and uh, less prone to vote for them. Uh, and of course, that shouldn't be the case. I mean, politics uh, should be out of it. Uh, all the decisions should be taken uh, only on the grounds of effectiveness uh, when it comes to meeting priorities. And that's why we, all sh we, we sh should all uh, be included uh, in scrutiny. That's why European institutions should exercise a role uh, and be tough because we uh, cannot uh, waste the money. We cannot spend the money in a way which is least effective. And here uh, at the European Committee of the Regions, with you uh, as, a, as, a, as a member and with uh, your colleagues and uh, regional presidents from member states, I am sure that uh, in, in a coalition and together uh, we can make sure that cities and regions do have direct access to EU funds for the benefit of every city. Um, now, uh, Rafael, um, if if uh, if I may, uh, you are one of the youngest mayors of uh, of leading a new capital. You are highly engaged in Warsaw to a fully sustainable city that meets in tackling the energy efficiency in buildings, the transport, the clean air. We are going to talk about these three topics. Um, uh, as we as we uh, go along now you are uh, particularly focused on engaging with citizens local neighborhoods and communities to boost civic participation and make sure that um, you know the transition towards climate neutrality the green transition is inclusive inclusive and fair and um, that's kind of the objective of the European climate pact isn't it um, what can you say about the European climate pact well, you know, there are quite a lot of initiatives all around Europe which are uh, fighting for, for uh, climate change. And now Climate Pact is an umbrella, is an umbrella which is to organize, to help organize all of those initiatives, put them under one roof and make them more effective so that all the non-governmental organizations, uh, the local and regional authorities, the citizens who fight for, uh, for uh, climate neutrality can do it in a way which is more effective. It's a enabler of cooperation with the European institutions so that we can actually work in synergy and increase awareness of the problem because you know all the younger generation know full, fully well that this should be our topmost priority but the older generation sometimes have doubts either even whether climate, uh, climate change exists or even if they know that it exists, they do not know what measures should be taken in order to fight it. Or, for example, you know, I've, I have quite a few friends who uh, are aware of uh, the climate change, but they are not that happy that we would, for example, um, try to reduce uh, uh, car circulation in the center of the city and, and prioritize public transportation. So we need to make those links visible so that people understand what kind of challenge are we facing and and what are the means of fighting it and that's what what's what's green pact is all all about about talking about acting in order to uh, to increase awareness and also uh increase the effectiveness of our actions through benchmarking for example because thanks to green pact we're meeting new people we are seeing what they're doing we're learning from one another we are uh re-energizing each each other to fight in a more effective way for, 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 for climate with climate change. So um, you are a climate pact ambassador, uh, which means that uh, that's exactly also your role as a as a climate leader uh, in Europe to to demonstrate that good practices are possible, that the economic benefit comes also um, in parallel of environmental benefits and in terms of engaging with citizens i i think uh, you do have some very concrete examples in warsaw on how you actually involved uh citizens and youth in particular on climate action um i've heard there's some big project uh, coming up well yes i mean first of all we do a lot of consultations on the projects that that we're proposing Secondly, we have uh, the participatory budget and we are 
Uh, we are uh, inviting people to put forward initiatives which uh, are there to fight uh, for climate neutrality, and we're pretty successful at that, at that. We have quite a lot of awareness exercises that we do with the citizens. But the most, uh, I think that the most revolutionary thing that we've done was a citizens panel. Citizens panel, it's a tool of direct, uh, direct democracy, whereby we, ch we chose 100 people from inhabitants of, of, of Warsaw to tell us about energy efficiency. And I, uh, and I uh, promised, I took upon myself to implement their, uh, their recommendations so that their recommendations are actually binding for me. And we received those recommendations on, 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 on energy uh, saving from the citizens directly. And I've, uh, and I've um, submitted myself to, to, to realize them. Uh, and I treat them as binding, so so that actually citizens are involved in the decision making. That's what we're doing. But also, you know, I'm, I'm not only the mayor of also I'm also a politician. So we are. You know, we, I have this initiative at the end of August where we uh, where we gather more than more than a thousand of young people from all around Poland to talk about the challenges of of the future and uh, um, and of course uh, climate change will be uh, our top. Uh, our, our top subjects to discuss so so that we can actually project the knowledge, increase the awareness and work with the young people all around the country and of course in my city in order to uh, to tackle the problem. That's, uh, that's extremely interesting uh, to see how, as you said, direct democracy in the making, implementing direct democracy in our uh, cities, in our local communities. That's what's all about, also about the Climate Pact. So we take the opportunity here to call on the audience um, and to check on the European Climate Pact website just because uh, if you are concerned about the climate, if, if you want to do something about the climate, or if you are already doing something about the climate, like, uh, you know, uh, taking pu public transport or cycling instead of taking your car, there are 16 different actions um, listed in the European uh, Climate Pact website. And, and the objective of the European Union is that between the 18th of June and the 17th of July, we reach the highest number of people pledging climate action in one month to be in the Guinness World Records book. So um, since Climate Pact was one of the topics today, Rafael, then we take the opportunity to call for action to our audience. And if you fly, want to fly less, get some solar, green your money, drive electric, switch your energy, insulate your home, and some other measures, you can let us know. And then, you know, these actions are not uh, hidden. And, uh, you know, we can also see what people in every day life they are doing. So let's yeah. let's go. Let's, one, yes. one, one, one sentence, if, if, if you allow me. I mean, I always, tell, I always listen, you know, take over some commitments yourself. And of course, it is difficult to be radical. So, I mean, for example, to say, OK, I'm not going to use my car, I'm going to use public transportation. Or, for example, to say, I'm not going to eat meat from today onwards. It's difficult. It's radical. If you are strong enough, do it. But if you're not strong enough, I mean, start with a small commitment. For example, I'm going to use bike, bikes and public transportation on the weekends. Or at least when I'm moving in my own district of the city, when I'm not going to the center or so on, then I will bike or I will walk. Or for example, you know, I will not eat meat uh, on, or, or I will eat meat only once a week. You know, start with, with small commitments, realistic ones, and then you can make a, a world of a difference. Because I know that it's difficult to simply say, you know, I'm not going to use my car. Warsaw is a huge city. I have to use a car because, you know, I need sometimes to be at 10 places at a time. But for example, you know, when in my private life, when I'm uh, spending a weekend with my family, I try to use the subway or bike or walk. And by the way, it is much better for your health. You, uh, you can lose some kilos after the epidemic. Which are so necessary after this pandemic and uh, when uh, someone, when people are in their beautiful forts, isn't it? <laughs> in any case, um, uh, Rafael, you, you touch a, a topic that for me I'm, uh, I'm very concerned. It's the role of consumer. Uh, in the fight uh, against global warming and versus the role of producers. Let's not forget today that sometimes people think that they are being asked big changes 
like drop their old car and buy a new one for 25,000 euros. People just don't have these 25,000 euros. On the other side, industry, coal, carbon intense industries, uh, tax uh, exemptions for fuel, for aircraft, uh, fuel, all these measures, they contribute so much to global warming. So uh, here, um, let me ask you, um, you know, uh, we put the, the, the spot on the consumer, but I always think that we have to push production towards sustainability as a key measure if we are to reach climate neutrality. I'm talking about uh, uh, program obsolescence. I'm talking about, uh, you know, buying, buying uh, uh, a charger every year because we didn't manage to put a single charger for all phones. What do you think about the role of uh, production, energy production, uh, transport, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, coal is still a problem in Poland and in other regions in Europe. What are we going to do from the production side, from the big emitters uh, of CO2 emissions? Uh, in addition to individual actions that we can all take? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, the things that we are talking about are very much linked because, I mean, as you raise the awareness, especially among the young people, uh, the young people are pressurizing politicians, they're pressurizing their parents uh, into behaving in a responsible way. So, for example, they ask, you know, what is the carbon footprint? Uh, why are we using this? Why are we using something which is more eco-friendly uh do we really need to use the car on that particular uh, occasion uh, and of course uh, you know this pressure is 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 is, is uh, organized by the grassroots but we need to do more and why the european union is so much needed uh because it gives us the legal framework and uh, it can uh, create laws which are going to actually uh, influence also the behavior of the producers uh, because uh, through uh, through uh, the whole legal framework, uh, one can influence the way uh, in which we use our cars. Because simply when we um, when we uh, take political decisions uh, which influence uh, the taxes, which influence um, you know, the benefits from uh, from production of of cars or other uh, vehicles, then we can actually influence the way in which uh, we can influence the pricing. The pricing of energy as well i mean for example you know 10 years ago um renewable energy was expensive uh, today it is much much cheaper in a few years it will be even cheaper than than fossil fuels similarly when uh european union policy and national policy is wise you know electric uh, electric cars uh will become uh, much 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 cheaper and this is the, the way forward uh, raising awareness and also creating a legal framework uh, and taking decisions, for example, on tax, which are going to simply lower prices of uh, those utilities um, uh, that are simply uh, friendly to their environment. This is the way forward, and that's going to happen anyhow. Uh, I'm talking sometimes to the uh, to the, polit the conservative politicians who tell me that they don't believe the global warming, and I tell them. Forget it. I'm not going to have that conversation with you because I'm not going to convince you because it's impossible. You're so set in your ways. But remember this, if we are not going to use the revolution and if we are not going to modernize our economy, invest in green solutions, then we are going to be relegated to the margins of the European society because Europe will go there anyhow. So either we, we go with them, either we become innovative green or simply our economy will not be able to compete because the rules will be adopted, which are you know, going to simply make, make fossil fuels uh, too expensive. And through certain decisions that we make as politicians, we can also reinforce it. For example, in Warsaw, we are, uh, we are giving those, uh, those, uh, those subsidies to people who are changing their uh, coal-powered um, furnaces uh, into uh, into um, uh, into renewables, or we pay uh, our citizens. We give them uh, money when they install uh, renewable energy, or uh, we have those special programs which uh, which uh, actually um, uh, make it easier to uh, to invest in retention of water. So those are the things that we can do in order to reinforce uh, reinforce uh, changes. Uh, through direct means, and that's why I was always pledging that the EU money that there should be that there should be programs 
of uh, the EU within the Green Deal that are uh, used directly by, by, by cities and regional authorities because we know best how to actually help citizens change the way in which they behave through simply um, uh, simply uh, reinforcing uh, such uh, such behaviors with with uh, with financial means. So, Mayor, you talked about uh, environmental sense and then economic sense. You know, it's about if you don't jump into the transition, it's going to happen anyway. Um, but there are certain very concrete examples where we can see, you know, uh, the question about reconciling environmental and economic benefit is actually. Uh, fully consolidated. The European Union actually is the proof that in the last 40 years, we managed to grow economically and decrease emissions. And it's absolutely possible. So it's kind of, if you don't do it for the environment, do it for the money. And here, uh, and let's straight forward go to buildings. Energy efficiency in buildings is the example where uh, you protect the environment and you save money at the same time. With insulation, of your windows with replacing a fossil fuel solves or heating systems. Um, and you've mentioned already the program of Warsaw uh, uh, in that sense. But I wanted to ask you, um, energy poverty in Europe, in my opinion, within all this debate about climate and uh, energy, it's one of the most dramatic aspects uh, in Europe. As much as 40 million Europeans cannot heat their homes properly in winter. Uh, that's 10% of the population. And um, uh, we've seen how energy prices have been growing up for the last 20 years. Uh, we are not going to enter on the monopoles uh, that still exist in many countries. But what can you, let's start by, um, uh, how are you tackling in Warsaw the question of energy poverty and the, the, the decreasing of uh, emissions from buildings? Well, yes, I mean, you know, this is this is our real problem in Europe, that some of the means are not controversial and are easy to implement. Some of them are uh, more controversial and some of them uh, are very controversial. Let me give you an example. I mean, I think that no one should be convinced that we should save energy and uh, energy efficiency measures are not controversial at all. And we can in implement them with with all the people being happy about them and that's exactly what we are doing and also we are tackling um energy poverty as well for example you know the the uh the poorest neighborhood in 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 warsaw uh they had a problem because they were not connected to the central heating uh 10 years ago only 10 percent of the district uh which was the most dispri disprivileged uh, was connected to the heating system now it's 50 60 percent so we are making a huge progress on connecting um, those regions, those districts of Warsaw to central heating. Or, for example, we pay for the exchanges of the heating system from fossil fuel to renewables. And this is not controversial. Everyone agrees that it should be done and we can see the palpable benefits. I can even tell you that, you know, we had in, a, in one of the districts of Warsaw, uh, we had uh, rankings in educational system which were a bit lower. And a lot of people were saying yes, because, you know, that's the problem that uh, people do not uh, take uh, sufficient attention and so on. And it turned out that the reason was very simple, that uh, simply some of those houses in winter were not warm enough because people couldn't afford it. And the kids were, uh, were catching cold more often and they're out of school for many more days than, uh, than kids in central Warsaw. So it has a huge impact on 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 the city that's why we are doing all of those measures connecting to the heating system and so on and so forth liquidating the the coal power stoves and so on which also has an impact on on clean air but this is relatively uncontroversial then you have a second uh, batch of of measures for example public transportation prioritizing public transportation uh limiting the movement of cars in the center of the city uh, we have plans of doing a uh, clean zone uh, in uh, in the historical center and so on and so forth. And people say, yes, we should do it. But then when it influences their own life, for example, you know, they say, no, no, I want to use my car. I want to enter the city center whenever I want. You know, you shouldn't uh, increase the, the parking uh, fees and so on and so forth. Then it becomes controversial. So people would agree on the on the direction. But then when it touches their own life and they have to change their habits, then it gets more difficult. And then, of course, the third, the third, um, the third uh, sort of category is the most difficult. 
because uh, in in Poland we are dependent 75 percent of uh, on fossil fuels. We are the most dependent European nation on coal, which also gives us certain uh, independence vis-a-vis vis-a-vis uh, uh, those countries which use energy as a political tool. And it is very very difficult to change it overnight. And of course, you know, the conservative government is doing not doing enough. They wasted six years in government in not ad- addressing these challenges. But it has to be said objectively that it is difficult because it requires a lot of money. It, it requires massive investments. It requires a lot of effort on the on the part of the people to to, to actually change jobs. And, and, and of course, the government and, and, and we can introduce those requalification schemes, but it's not easy. And finally, there is this cultural thing. I mean, it is very difficult for people for whom coal mining is part of their culture. It's a part of their DNA. Changing it overnight, as proved in Britain, as proved in Spain, as proved in France, is not easy. So, you know, that's the problem, that we have those different categories of things. Some of them are not controversial, we can do them overnight. Some of them are more controversial and require the change of habits. And some of them are the most difficult and, and, and actually necessitate massive investment. But of course, we should focus on those because those are going to give us change. And we should invest the money wisely, talk to the people, include them, allow them to requalify, uh, and and that's what we should be doing uh, on the national mm. level. So, so it's about raising awareness, involving citizens, education, obviously, but then offering alternative and new jobs to the people. Yes. Um, before we go to transport, which is a very, very um, uh, popular topic in our chat today, I want just to talk about energy bills. Um, Poland is below the EU average uh, of the kilowatt price per hour, but still in the EU prices, energy bills have gone up substantially in the last 20 years. We have, I I often uh, put the example of telecommunications and air transport, where the liberalization of the European Union has benefited the consumer. Obviously, that's the ultimate goal. We pay much more or less for phone calls today than 25 years ago. And we, lucky or not for the climate, well, that's another topic. Uh, the monopoles on airlines have, um, you know, uh, we are, it's much cheaper uh, to fly and to travel. And there has been in democratization of traveling in the, in the past 25 years. With the energy, it seems that something blocks we cannot we do not manage so far to decrease energy bills for the european consumer that's also a main reason why energy poverty rates are so high in europe do you think we are seriously uh, reaching an end uh, to the energy monopoles and that we are going towards a decentralization of energy production and uh, like most importantly, are we finally going to get energy bills lower for EU citizens anytime soon? Well, yes, hopefully. I mean, unfortunately, the prices of energy up, and if the uh, national governments are not keeping up with uh, with uh, the European laws uh, and are not investing in changing the energy mix, you know, those those bills will go up. And of course, it's a paradox because the prices of green energy actually go down and we need to uh, invest. We need to think about smart grids. We need to uh, to increase those possibilities of using the uh, energy and making it cheaper, obviously. But at the same time, we cannot lose from sight energy security. And, and that's the problem that, you know, the same governments which are trying to uh, to to be as green as possible now they want to uh, open a new chapter of fantastic relations with russia when russia is being incredibly aggressive uh, and when it it uses the uh, uses energy as a as a tool as a political tool so i mean consistency is very important you know we need to decrease the prices we need to change our energy mix but at the same time we cannot forget about energy security because you know it's it, there has to be a balance between the two, uh, and I hope that with the uh, legal fl- framework that the European Union is is introducing, uh, energy sooner or later w- from renewables will become cheaper. But for now, I mean, the situation is difficult. And in Poland, for example, the energy prices are skyrocketing. Uh, why? Because the government was not doing enough to actually adopt the new circumstances. They they've uh, wasted uh, their years in government uh, when it comes to to uh, uh, meeting these challenges of, of, of new green uh, economy. And, and that's why we should 
as citizens, as, 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 as opposition politicians, as responsible people, we should be pushing the governments to, to, to actually be more, be more innovative and be, be more ambitious. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, from the audience about transport. And in any case, uh, transport was a key topic of our conversation today. Um, so transport accounts for around 40% of CO2 emissions in the European Union. Um, uh, we have uh, many questions on the chat. Um, you've, you've answered some of them. I was talking to, to a Polish friend living in Warsaw. Um, he said that the public transport is in Warsaw is one of the best. It is. It is. I mean, uh, I mean, it is very punctual. It is clean and 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 more and more uh, low or zero emission. We are investing in, in the subway. We are investing in the tram lines. We've bought. We had the biggest tender in Europe outside of London for uh, no emission buses. We bought 130 no emission buses and low emission buses. Uh, so yes, I mean, we, we treat it as an absolute priority and also we are prioritizing public transportation in the cities through bus line, lines and so on and so forth because we think that, that that's the way forward. And uh, more than 50% of, of, of the people uh, living in Warsaw use public transportation, which is a great result. Of course now, I mean, there is a certain influence of the pandemic where those rates are falling a bit, but we hope they're going to go back up after the, uh, after the pandemic. And I mean, you, you know, we need to do it and we need to advertise the way that our public transportation works really great. I mean, you know, I live at the outskirts of Warsaw and, uh, you know, sometimes when I use my car, it takes between 40 minutes to an hour to get to the city center. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half. When I jump on the subway, it's 25 minutes, 28 minutes. So when I do, when I really need to be on time, I use the subway. There you go. Um, let me ask you a question from the from the audience. Is Warsaw planning a zero emission zone when it comes to you know a clean transport zone? But you did say uh, already that the city center. Yes. Um, yes, can you tell planning, us a little bit more planning, about it? We are planning to have a zero emission zone in in the historical center and around it. Uh, now, of course, that's also the decision which needs to be done by the city council. But we are going to be proposing such solutions. When um, when do you think that's going to enter into force? And um, if well, I may that also depends, ask, that depends whether I will have the majority for it in the city council, because you know some of uh, colleagues of mine, even in my own uh, in my own caucus, are not that progressive. Uh, but we hope we we can do it in in, in the coming years. Uh, first, plan it and then execute it. Very good. Another question from the audience on transport, which is the most popular topic here. Um, what measures limiting the demand for individual car transport are planned by Warsaw? We are kind of answering this with your combination of buses, trams and metro. Um, you also planning this yes. second metro line, right? Well, we are building the second second metro line. We are investing in, in railway, which is in the bounds of the city. Uh, we are building uh, those uh, uh, park and ride places. Uh, we've built quite a few in Warsaw, the outskirts, so that you can leave your car at a parking and then uh, switch into uh, public transportation. We are doing bus lanes. We are, of course, building bike bike lanes, and, and more and more Varsovians use bikes uh, to commute. Uh, you know, we were starting from a very, very low level of 1%. We're slowly reaching 10 and more. So, so, of course, it's not yet Copenhagen or Amsterdam, but more and more people use bikes. Uh, and, and we are also changing the city centers so that it's, that it's uh, more uh, amenable to people who, uh, who walk, who use public transportation or a bike. So I, I was in Madrid last week, uh, work-related and keeping the safety measures, but La Gran Vía Madrileña, uh, they also reduced uh, by two car lanes uh recently and now it is a much more pleasant pedestrian zone which very much benefits the local commerce and businesses um but from theaters to cinemas to uh shops um so how how can we um you know um better communicate or uh you know uh, i've heard that there is a certain controversy uh in warsaw uh, with the bike lanes but um 
uh, I don't know how to it. I mean, we know that it, it's beneficial from the environmental and health perspective for citizens, but also for local businesses. So how, how can we better manage this transition and people's expectations? By simply demonstrating it to them. I mean, you know, the, the problem of Warsaw is this. I mean, it's one of the most dynamic cities in Warsaw, and it has those islands of activity, fantastic places where, you know, there are hundreds of restaurants, hundreds of clubs which live 24 hours a day. And then, you know, there are those, the, there are those pathways, those avenues in the city center which are kind of dead because there are only banks there, there are only big chains there, there are no, no greenery, no uh no uh bars and pubs and so on and so forth and 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 you know there are quite wide uh streets uh, where where people uh you know try to try to speed up i mean what we are trying to do we are trying to remodel the city center so to bring life back to those big avenues uh we try to control the prices of 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 uh, of some of those rented spaces so that booksellers uh, the little studios uh, um, uh, and uh, and and bars and restaurants uh, can come back and actually en enliven those those avenues and and bring more benches and bring more uh, bike lanes and greenery and so on and so forth. We want to stitch the center together so that those islands of activity are connected. Uh, and and that's what we're doing. That's what we're planning. But it of course means that that we want to slow down a bit the traffic in the in the city center, uh, make one or two streets pedestrian zones, uh, just as it's done everywhere uh, in 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 the modern world. Because we want to give the city back to the inhabitants, so that the center of the city lives. And of course, sometimes you need to use a car if you need to go to to a hospital or, or to, a, to, to, to a business center or so on and so forth. But yeah, go there for two, three hours, do your business and, and, and then leave. I mean, it's, it, you, you should, it shouldn't be affordable for someone to come and leave his or her car for two or three days in the city center. I mean, the city center is best communicated with the rest of, 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 of the city and should be given back to the people who really want to use it. So yes, if you need to use a car, we will facilitate that but we will give biggest priority for public transportation for walking for biking because the city center should be stitched together and work as an organism uh which 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 lives and pulsates 24 hours a day thank you uh mayor um so almost almost 2 million people in Warsaw, right? Uh, 1.8 yeah. million people, very vibrant, dynamic, a lot of real estate going on, new construction, but you also talk about greening. How do you reconcile um, this dynamism, obviously, and a vibrant Poland capital growing um, in, a, in, a, in a rapid uh, path and at the same time um, willing to green the city and obviously tackle uh, one of the major problems I've heard in uh, for Warsaw, uh, people living in Warsaw, which is clean air. How do you reconcile economic growth of a vibrant capital with greening the city? Well, I mean, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, people wanted to buy apartments, live in a city center, but now they want to buy apartments in the city center or in the uh, uh, in the districts of Warsaw when there is a park nearby, when there are benches, when there are, you know, green spaces, because people know how important it is. So, uh, so now we simply uh, are more demanding on the investors so that they create green spaces, so that they conserve energy, so that they conserve water, and so on and so forth. And I think also, you know, people who are buying apartments now are pushing for that. Uh, people who are building also, uh, uh, you know, uh, offices uh, are now much more demanding. And I think that people who work in those offices want to have, want to, to, to work in a place which is greener, which has more light and so on and so forth. So that's why Warsaw is, is transforming itself. And for example, you know, those, those uh, offices which were built 15 years ago, 12 years ago, people are leaving them. They want new, modern, more green, more, more light, and so on and so forth. That's why Warsaw is so dynamic and so vibrant and it's, and it's changing so quickly. Because all of us, we, you know, we, we exist, exercise pressure on, on the investors so that, that uh, they take quality uh, of life into, 
into the account. That's what we're doing now. I mean, Warsaw is at a, dif at a different stage of development. We are not only about expanding our city, but we are about quality of life, like uh, some of the most ambitious cities in, uh, in, um, uh, in Europe. So, you know, please come, see it, spend a lot of money, and you will see that, that I'm right. Um, Rafael, um, nine million trees. Yes, nine well, million are, trees is. We are counting. We are counting. I mean, we've decided also. I mean, you know, I was at a Bloom Harvard program for mayors, and uh, what uh, they've taught us there: data, data, data. You have to base your decisions on data. So that's what we are doing. You know, we are installing those 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 uh, new installations to actually measure uh, air quality. We are counting trees in Warsaw and also uh, trying to, to see what kind of financial benefit it brings to the city, because it does, uh, in order to base our decisions on data and in order to be able to show to the citizens that actually investing in greenery um, is beneficial for all. We've also uh, created this, this, uh, this uh, green fund where investors can actually pay into the, the, this common fund and decide what they want to change in the city whether they want to uh, invest in, in parks or whether they want to invest in, in uh, retention reservoirs to bring more water to also uh, and so on and so forth. So yes, we're doing it in mm -hmm. sync with together and trees. I've planned to, to, to plant another million uh, till the end of my, uh, my, my term uh, in order to have as many as possible. And yes, sometimes it's, it's great to, to actually count them. It's sometimes great to name things. It's sometimes great to measure things because then you can you can show the results and 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 make uh, informed decisions you're talking about measuring and we have a question from the audience here uh, how do you intend to motivate citizens to be more environmental friendly to make them contribute but the second part of the question says can you create a contest a tracker we're talking about measuring here where citizens know exactly how much they contribute what can we say? Yes, I mean, I mean, we are. I mean, some some citizens even invent uh, such such competitions through the participatory budget. We've done, uh, for example, it in Vavar, in one of the districts of, of Warsaw, where we invest in renewables, and and we have this huge clock, which shows the results. It shows how much money was saved, how much energy was saved in, in this particular district of Warsaw, uh, and it's mm -hmm. great because people can see, you know, every day. Uh, how they contribute to 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 the uh, um, prosperity of their own district and to 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 the um, to the environment. So uh, here about about uh, let me ask you uh, please. Um, uh, you know the, the the relation between climate and health um, is uh, a direct one. Uh, around four hundred thousand people die uh, annually of uh, of the impact and uh, consequences of pollution and um, I, I have to ask you because uh, obviously my, my Warsaw friends told me as well that uh, sometimes uh, you have no choice but to recommend uh, Warsaw citizens especially the elderly uh, to stay home during certain winter days where there are some pollution peaks um, I am I've been told that this is uh, something that very unfortunately has been happening regularly uh, for the, the past years. What's the situation now? And do you think that all these measures you are implementing in Warsaw will hopefully and eventually uh, lead to, you know, a cleaner air in winter times as well, where people can freely uh, walk around uh, and open yes. the windows if they wish. Yes, I mean, you know, we are doing everything we can, but of course it takes time. So you can sometimes see very quickly locally that the situation has been changed. Because, for example, when we took away, you know, the coal power stoves in Praga, in one of the districts of Warsaw, immediately after a year, you can see the difference in quality of air. But the pollution, and especially winter year in winter days, sometimes when there is low temperature and there is no wind, and so oh, there is a little wind uh, which blows the emissions from outside of Warsaw, but it's not strong enough as to blow it over. You know, we have those days where the emissions peaks are huge, and of course, you know, I mean, we are not going to be able to deal with it overnight or in a year or two because it is dependent on the energy mix of the whole country because the emissions are blown from outside of Warsaw as well. We cannot change the way in which people use uh, their cars uh, overnight. 
but slowly but surely i mean those indexes are improving and will improve uh, when 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 we have enough financial means to actually uh, bring some of our programs to into into conclusion so locally we see the differences already when it comes to the city as a whole it will take time but surely uh, you know those indexes are changing for the better thank you very much uh mayor um so um, well, um i'm i'm having more questions from the audience um let me pick up this um like do you think can cities put effective pressure on national authorities for the necessary regulation and support to facilitate the creation of clean transport zones um uh, and the construction uh, and upgrading of walking and cycling infrastructure obviously there are sometimes political choices not sometimes often political choices drive policies um uh, do you find support or uh you how uh, do you find support from national police national authorities when it comes to greening cities here for instance the question is on transport and uh, you know upgrading well, cycling Unfortunately, you know, uh, the, the relations with the conservative governments are strained in Poland of all regional and local authorities because they treat us, especially the mayors of the cities, smaller and bigger as a foe and they're distributing money according to political criteria. So they are trying not to invest too much in the big cities. But I hope that at the end of the day, they will realize that if they want to meet the priorities of the European Union, they need to invest in the cities as well. So, I mean, you know, I hope that that at the end of the day they will be pushed into investing in the cities and treating uh, those priorities seriously. Um, now um, we are a few months ahead of COP26, the United Nations uh, climate change uh, annual summit. Um, we are in a situation where people uh, have the tendency to forget that we live in a climate emergency and maybe have the tendency to push for economic measures that do not take into consideration the environment and the lowering of emissions what at a global scale you know climate is, is is about acting local but there is a global debate about climate uh how do you see uh the situation right now uh, on, on the global climate agenda. What do you expect also from COP26 in Glasgow next November? Well, I expect more ambitious goals. And, and, and of course, you know, the European Union has always been ambitious. Now we are very hopeful with the change of the American administration with Joe Biden, because he is much, much more ambitious on, on green agenda. And even the Chinese in the past 10 years, they have did a U-turn on their policy. So uh, I'm uh, hopeful because if, if those three uh, biggest players in the world treat, uh, treat global warming seriously, the European Union, the United States of America and China, I think that we can make progress. The global to the local, one question about how is life today in Warsaw? Um, what measures, uh, safety measures for uh, against the, 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 the COVID-19 are in place and um, how is, uh, how is, uh, Normal is life in Warsaw. Well, today. the government the government has opened up the economy, uh, and uh, and uh, life uh, kind of went back to normal. Uh, Sixty percent of of the inhabitants of, of Warsaw are uh, are inoculated. So, and I hope you know that the whole program will will speed up because it's slowing down, unfortunately. And uh, we need to be vaccinated because if we're vaccinated by eighty percent, we limit the 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 risk of of of, of the fourth wave but of course we are watching what's happening in, in in britain and in spain you know the delta the delta variant is spreading uh widely so we hope that it will have a limited impact on our city but but we all know that it depends on the level of vaccination on, on how those vaccines uh how effective they are so we are you know i had for example for a month we didn't have a city a city covid um uh, uh, um, uh, alarm desk because we were meeting, you know, in those meetings, uh, emergency meetings every week, twice or three times a week. For a month, we didn't have one, and I just called one today because we need to observe the situation as it is changing. 
So thank you very much, Rafael. We are uh, closely uh, reaching the end of our uh, first Green Deal Hour uh, with you uh, and our audience live on Facebook. Um, five very short questions um, uh, for, for you, please, for our audience. Um, tell us, uh, would you advise us a cool book to read this summer? Oh, yeah, there are plenty of books uh, I could advise you on. I'm reading one on the Crusades, uh, you know, by, by Jones, I think his name is. I'm reading Henry James, uh, Henry James's short stories, uh, which uh, are actually quite, quite intriguing, even though written more than 120 years ago. And I'm a fan of detective stories, so I can always say, read Robert Harris. He's always fantastic. And, and John Kerr. K-E-R-R. Fantastic book. <laughs> Excellent. So, see, so there's, uh, uh, there's a there's a variety of options for. A... Yes, uh, we can see that. Are you in your office in the yes, city council? Yep, you are. So tell me, what's your favorite band? Jamiroquai. Jamiroquai, excellent. Yep. Um, <laughs> excellent. I wanted to tell you. Uh, lately, mine is Oscar and the Wolf. They are from Antwerp, Belgium. So um, I wanted, <laughs> you'll check them out, thanks. So um, tell us, um, what are you doing this summer? I don't know, I don't know yet. I hope I will have time for, for a vacation, but I will plan it uh, in August because I always plan my vacation in August and we'll see. I hope I will we'll see it as always. <coughs> Sorry, you hope you, excuse me, the sound. I will, I will be able to do a bit of diving. A bit of diving, there you go. Another recommendation for our audience. And then my last question, um, there's a dog star. Yeah. Who's more famous, you, you, you or, your do or, or the dog? And of course my dog? dog. Of course my dog, my dog, uh, <laughs> he's a French bulldog. Uh, and he was very much disappointed that France does not play anymore in the World Cup. Uh, so, uh, so now he's cheering for Italy um, because, you know, those are the, his closest friends. Uh, his name is Bumble, which is a bubble in Polish. And he's a pretty nice fella. Very good. Uh, he has more f Twitter followers than you? Well, not yet, but, but I think <laughs> he's quite popular and, and even even my um, uh, political foes do not hate him because it's impossible to hate a French bulldog, is it? <laughs> I would have, and the audience would as well, certainly have many, many more questions. Just allow me please to have a, a very final one. When we will have the pleasure to see you in Brussels again? Well, I hope after, after, after vacation, I hope that there will be no more lockdowns and no more waves of COVID and that we can actually resume our work in, in, in September. Excellent. We have uh, a lot coming up uh, after the summer. We have the European Union Week of Regions and Cities, which is the largest event uh, in the EU. It's all about cities and regions and uh, cohesion policy and investing in in sustainable policies and how cities and regions are actually the drivers of uh, the climate neutrality transition that the European Union is aiming for 2050. Uh, Rafał Czaszkowski, thank you so much for being with us in this first, very first edition of the Green Deal Hour, um, organized by the European Committee of the Regions, the European Union Assembly of Cities and Regions. It's 1 p.m. Brussels time. It's been a pleasure, uh, very interesting, uh, very inspiring. I hope it was the same feeling for our audience uh, to the point that they are going to take climate action. We are all responsible a bit uh, for uh, the biggest challenge of our uh, times, we could even say. Thank you so much, Rafael, for being with us. Um, we'll see you in Brussels well, very soon. Thank you, everyone. Y yes, certainly. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. And remember, you know, Muchísimas eat, less, gracias. Eat, less meat, eat less eat, eat more seasonable, seasonable fruit and vegetables, walk and bike. That's what we can all do for fun from the fork from the fork to the fork thank you very much mr gracias. Uh, mayor gracias. gracias and thank you everyone for watching 
we'll see you very soon in our next Green Deal Hour. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.